He's been the PI of several NIH and NBHB uh, funded studies of interventions to improve early development. Um, so um, he's the, uh, the head of the LEND program um, at, uh, at SUNY and he has many interests. And with that, I will, um, uh, I will um, let him uh, give you great information about his work on folate antibody and trajectories of, of autism and early childhood um, identification and treatment. Do you have your your um, your PowerPoint? Yeah, great. Sorry, can you all hear me? And yeah, just from the beginning, excellent. Okay, okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is to uh, go over very, very quickly because I think uh, uh, Ed has covered it, an overview of, of folate receptor autoantibodies, the linked ASD, use of leucoborin. I'd like to show a, a, two clips of a before and after of a child we treated a four-year-old with leucoborin, looking at, and then look at a, an objective measure, the BOSC, I'll talk about that in a minute, to look at how you objectively measure social communication change. I'd like to come back to the questions that Ed raised about postnatal and prenatal impacts, um, and then finally move to how this is the rationale for our current uh, Brain Foundation funded study. So let me start. Um, just to say, I, I have no financial interest in any of these. We will talk about non-FDA approved use of leucoborin. So can I just say, as a relevant pediatrician, uh, I've worked, uh, our clinic largely sees children on the spectrum at different ages, and we work for a long time. We see it as a complex, multifactorial process. So when a colleague said, you know, introduce me to some of this work, and Ed's work and, and Richard's that, oh, autism, it's due to a lack of folate in the CNS. Um, I must admit that my reaction was this. It sounded like something out of a tabloid. It sounded like, oh my goodness, autism cure found and it's a vitamin. And I was uh, skeptical to say the least. Um, I've come around. Uh, if I could just go over, uh, there's some very convincing evidence on this um, that that folate receptors disrupt the folate receptor alpha, that it results in CNS folate deficiency, the strong link to autism spectrum, uh, I, that, it see, that you certainly see a very, very high rate of in children diagnosed with ASD, this would be comparing to folate receptor positive rates, maybe up 10 to 15% in the general population, depending on the study. Um, but most strikingly, and this is especially work that, uh, that Dr. Fry has done, that treating with leucoborin, uh, bypassing the, the folate receptor blocking step and correcting central nervous system folate, really shows a, a clear clinical improvement, certainly in language, but also in social communication in preschool and school-aged children. So let me start by seeing if I can get this to work. I'm going to um, show a four-year-old. Sorry, if I could just go back. Um, so this is a four-year-old with autism spectrum. Um, we, he had language delay, very poor social interaction, and we arranged the testing uh, through Ed's lab for, and he was positive for blocking FRA. So let me show, um, if I just open this. And I, we are more race cars. Let's open this. Let's open, let's see what we can do with this. Can I just ask, are you all able to hear me? Was that okay? Is that working? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. One for you. Look, and one for me. Should we erase the cards? Let's see what this does. Put this down. Oh, good job. Can you turn this? Let me turn it. Can you turn it? Yes, good. What, what is that? What animal is that? 
So chicken. Good job. What else do we have? Let's do another one. Oh, let's do it together, Nikos. Let's see, can we do it together? You do one and I'll do this one. Look, which one do you want to do first? You pick one here and I'll do the same one here. Okay, you want to pick this one? Yeah. Oh, you want to do race cars? Ready? Three. Okay, so we treated him for six months with uh, two milligrams per kilo of leucovorin, and this is when he came back. Number one, I have a chicken also. Is yours not closing? There we go. Turn it this way. Like that. Turn it. Yep. Oh, I think you do. There you go. Who's that? Open. What animal is that, Nico? This one. That's a horsey. That's a pig. Should we see what noises these animals make? Look. I have a farmer here. And where does the horse go? Can you tell me where these animals go? Tell me where these animals go. Look, there's there's a picture of the animal right here, and then you have to match the animal. Can you match the animal with the picture? I'll help you. What what animal is this? Where does pig go? Right there. Yeah, that's right. And then it makes a noise. You want to push him down? Push him down. That's a cow. That's the farmer. That's a horse. Where's our sheep? Did we lose our sheep? 
Oh, here she is. There we go. Yes. And if you press them down, you'll hear the noises they make. That's pretty impressive, um, Harris. I think uh, maybe we move on and say good time. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Do you know the song? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm not working. Uh, so what should we do now? Okay. So, um, okay. So we, we used a measure called the BOSC, and um, this basically is a brief observation of social communication change. I don't want to go through the algorithm. The point is that for this and for several, about 15 different features, it really operationally has you score. Uh, some, it's derived from the ADOS by the same authors, with a low score being um, a more typical child, a higher score being more autistic. So on eye contact, this child went from um, baseline of four before and now scored a one. On social overtures, he went from a baseline of five down to three. If you look at the overall scoring, if you add these all up, he, he, first of all, if I could just ask clinically, is this child still on the autism spectrum? I think the answer is yes. But with an overall score going from 39 down to 19, I think it's consistent with both the parents telling us and our own impression that this is a much more cooperative, engaged, and responsive child. Okay, so this led to, um, proposals that we could ameliorate ASD by early identifying and treating it. Um, but I think the treatment strategies, as Ed started talking about, will depend on understanding what's going on with FRA. I, this, as, as Ed covered, are we talking about um, sort of postnatal um, exposure to milk, for example, triggering some degree of titer and leading to this, and then we would look in the pediatric period to identify and treat uh, to, to reduce and, and autism. On the other hand, if we're talking about parents who are positive and this is being transmitted, and especially when the mother is positive, then um, you want to look at screening mother and father and looking at obstetric care. Why does it matter? This is a uh, work from Dr. Raymakers. I think he presented last year. Um, basically, this is the CARS score, where anything over 30 would be meeting threshold and the higher, more autistic, comparing blue baseline. He was then, he had a range of kids of different ages, but then treated them for two years, and this would be the score after two years of leucoborin treatment. And where K is the positivity of the child and the mother, P the father. So if you could just look at the difference when the child is positive, that both parents are negative, the baseline, first of all, across is somewhat lower. The improvement with leucoborin much more striking. At the other end, if the child is positive, both parents are positive, they're starting out at a much higher baseline. And in fact, the improvement is slight and not significant. So this matters. As Ed said, FRA positivity runs in families um, that something like 60 to 70 in one, one of his studies, of parents as well as non-affected siblings were also FRA positive, raising the question, why is it that if you're FRA positive, why do you sometimes get a picture of ASD in some individuals and not in others? Okay, so I, I, think, I think the answer clearly has to do with timing of when the FRA is turning positive, as well as the interplay of many other factors, metabolic factors, genetic factors, and uh, exposures. Um, as, I, as far as I know, though, there have not been longitudinal studies. The studies we've heard so far are cross-sectional, looking at where a parent or a child is long after a child is diagnosed, but there haven't been studies starting at birth and looking forward of FRA status in the parents and the child in terms of their ASD development. And so the question we are asking in our Brain Foundation uh, study is, if we were to examine the trajectory of FRA status and looking at later diagnosis of infants and starting with these are infants at risk for spectrum based on already having an, uh, parents coming in with an older sibling who is positive, could we tease apart the contributions of 
F rays that are present in the newborn, as in uh, prenatally, from those that develop later in infancy, and how does that correlate with the emergence and severity of ASD features in subsequent years of life? Okay, so the goals of our Brain Foundation and O'Sullivan Foundation grant study, first of all, to look at that, to look at the, the trajectory of F ray status in cord blood, and then at six and 12 months, and compare that to the clinical course we will try very hard to go through the second year of life. It's a short, the grant period is short, um, but to look at which do, when and how much do uh, symptoms and, and a diagnosis of autism uh, emerge. Secondarily, to look at brain function, to use FNIRS, uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is a non-invasive neuroimaging, as well as what's more classical being used is eye tracking as early biomarkers to look for even in infancy uh, and there's studies on certainly in eye tracking and some in FNIR suggesting even before autism emerges, you can see differences in brain function response to social stimuli versus not. Uh, and if we can then see how they correlate with FRA status and uh, eventually a later ASD diagnosis, the overall goal would be to pave the way for studies using leucovorin treatment and uh, in infancy and eventually prenatally. So the, how we're doing this, uh, that we'd like to enroll 30 to 35 pregnant mothers um, who have a previous child with autism spectrum, who are gonna deliver at either Downstate or some of our affiliated hospitals to determine the status, uh, FRA status in cord blood, follow in, in a, we're figuring we're at each step gonna get some uh, loss to follow up. Um, following the, the, this cohort through the first year of life to look at ultimate diagnosis with ASD, measuring FRA status at 6, 12, and 24 months, in addition to looking at a, a whole series of environmental factors, toxic exposures, as Dr. Fry uh, talked about, um, and uh, especially milk and bovine milk exposure. And then to look at their cognitive as well as social development at six, nine, and 12, there are not a lot of measures in the first year of life. One is the communication symbolic behavior scales. Uh, the Mullen is used for cognitive and uh, language. Uh, we would also use the FNIRS and eye tracking. And then to, the idea would be to continue them into the second year of life when you can start to use uh, more classic gold, gold standard measures such as the ADOS, the ADIR, the uh, autism diagnostic inventory and continue with the. So in conclusion, if we could better understand the child's FRA trajectory, the ways it's influenced by the parent's FRA status, environmental factors, how these correlate with manifestations of ASD and brain function, could we then better design treatment and preventive interventions, including which, where, what kind of approach? Are we starting in infancy or should we really need to start in prenatally? as Dr. Clark was saying. So getting back to is, 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 is a vitamin going to cure autism? I think probably not, but is Foley treatment, can it make a major difference in ameliorating and improving functioning in very large subsets of individuals with ASD? I think so. So thank you, thank you very much. Thanks so much for that great uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Uberman. Um, we're supposed to have a break uh, we were supposed to have a 15 minute break, but I would uh, propose that uh, if you could take any questions in the Q&A, you know, um, through typing in and maybe we take a 10 minute break and come back at um, 